All right, Ariel, I'll kick it off to you um, to get us started. Um, and also folks, I'll be sending invites to our GitHub repository if you're not already a writer. Wonderful. Uh, the common refrain of uh, at Zoom calls everywhere. Can you see my screen now that I'm sharing it? We actually we've not... cannot. Is it sharing now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Uh, welcome everyone to GitHub Intro for Beginners. Um, this is based on uh, the Mozilla Science Lab study group orientation and the friendly GitHub intro that was developed uh, by Kirsty Whitaker. So I just wanted to give a shout out. And it's a modified version of a training that um, the research community management team at the Alan Turing Institute give to their communities as well to help them onboard to one approach to collaborative documents and developing them. Um, I believe, will we share the uh, link to the paired online materials in the chat? Indeed, they are linked in our pad uh, on line 10, uh, but we'll link it directly in the chat as well. Amazing. Um, and just to flag to folks, it's a bit difficult for me to check the chat, but Anne will be monitoring it as well, I suspect, Kirsty. So feel free to post questions, comments. This is an interactive session. It's intended um, by the end to get you comfortable and familiar with GitHub so that you can open your own pull requests and issues um, in preparation for the Turing Way book dash, but also for other projects that are hosted on GitHub. Um, so we're starting with a brief intro to the Turing Way today. Uh, then we'll take you through GitHub and an introduction. Um, and I am excited to do this. I'm a non-technical person. So my first intro to GitHub was with the Turing Way as well. We'll move into hands-on exercises. We're gonna get you doing pull requests and merges and dealing with conflicts. And then finally, um, for the last bit, we will talk about how the Turing Way specifically uses GitHub because we have a number of people here who are prepping for our book dash call, um, sessions, which are starting next week um, for the November section. Um, so we'll talk through some of the uh, specifics there to get you familiar with our repository and raring to go for Monday. So yes, as a reminder, this is a hands-on workshop. Please make sure you have registered for a GitHub account and that you're logged in so that you're ready to go. Um, once you've got your GitHub username, please make sure Anne is aware of it by adding to the shared notes document or by pinging her directly uh, and she will add you as a contributor to the Turing Way. So hopefully if you've signed up for this call, you have previously heard of the Turing Way, but just in case anybody has stumbled across us on the internet, um, the Turing Way is a community-led guide to data science. We are uh, very uh, centered around involving and supporting a diverse community to make research reproducible, ethical, and collaborative for everyone. So we have a series of five guides. That is the book um, that we refer to. We have a community that develops and maintains and expands and revises that guide and that, those guides, and that is Anybody who would like to uh, come in and suggest changes and improvements and get involved is welcome to do that as long as they adhere to our code of conduct. We have collaborators right across the globe. Truly, I think maybe somebody from every continent has contributed to the Turing Way, and this is a fact that we're particularly proud of. And we also advocate for culture change. The whole point of the book is uh, the different guides is to make uh, reproducible, ethical, and collaborative research too easy not to do. So there's no excuse for not knowing best practices or not understanding how to approach collaborative and ethical research, particularly in data science and AI. We uh, support cultural change through the Turing Way. Uh, it's been incubated at the Alan Turing Institute um, and that was funded through the UK government's strategic priority fund investment to help change the culture of data science. Uh, this next stat is a little bit old, uh, as of September 2023, so that was a year ago, we had over 300 chapters written by 450 contributors from all continents, uh, right across third sector industry and academic perspectives. We've influenced a number of different policymakers. You can see uh, the variety of reports and resources that we've been mentioning, and this is just a highlight of the culture change that we have um, uh, sort of been responsible for and that we're very proud of. 
So we have a very collaborative, highly distributed team that can't always sit down in a room in person and work together on a single document. But we still want people from across the globe to be able to effectively collaborate with each other and to feel the benefit of that collaboration. To make this simple and to help manage that collaborative approach to developing resources and maintaining our guides, we use version control. And this is the key point uh, that we'll come back to. Um, version control allows you to track your project history in a way that is systematic, in a way that is to an extent automatic, in a way that is easily reviewable later on as well. And it makes it easier for people to collaborate on a single document because it's clear who's added what at which point in time and you can see how the document has evolved over time. This is a great quote um, taken from the OpenSkates blog, uh, GitHub for supporting, contributing and failing safely. Collaboration is the most compelling reason to manage a project with Git and GitHub. My definition of collaboration includes hands-on participation by multiple people, including your past and future self, as well as an asymmetric model in which some people are active makers and other people only read or review. And this is a very accurate reflection of the Turing Way, where we have some people who are reading and writing chapters, some people are reviewing material, and people are also coming back to chapters that they've previously written and going, oh, God, what did I do there? How am I going to update this? So that's why we love using um, Git and in particular GitHub to manage it. Just a quick note on version control. Uh, we love version control as well, but I've mentioned a few of the benefits here, but um, just to add, version control allows us to define formalized ways that we can move together, we can work together. So how do we sign off on one version or another? What, what point which, what is the point at which we move from version one to version 1.1 to version two, for example? We have a robust and rigorous log of changes to a file without renaming files. And if anyone's seen that um, PhD comics, uh, Paul High and Deeper comics um, sketch of a poor uh, postdoctoral, a poor doctoral student trying to get uh, their final, 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 final. Uh, document uh, over the line for their thesis uh, with increasingly elaborate uh, file namings, you'll know the pain of trying to, <laughs> to keep the version straight and invariably not managing it. That doesn't happen on GitHub. It also interestingly allows us to quickly undo a set of changes and it also helps you to understand the code and debug. And then finally, it's a backup. So if something goes wrong in version three, there's always the opportunity to roll back to version two and continue on from there and fix your mistakes. Thanks, Anne, for sharing the reference in the uh, comments. Uh, so a note on Git. Git is one of the most widely used version control systems in the world. It's actually a free open source tool and GitHub sits on top of it almost. It's a popular website for hosting and sharing Git repositories remotely. Um, and if you are brand new to GitHub and Git, then it's a really, it's a much more user-friendly uh, way, particularly if you consider yourself to be non-technical of getting into version control and understanding how to use uh, Git in a particular interface. So we'll go through some terminology very quickly as well. Um, you'll have heard me mention the phrase repo or repository. This is simply a collection of files in a folder or directory. Um, we use repos or repositories on GitHub as sort of the main unit of uh, organization around which um, a lot of other stuff is built. So you can manage permissions at the repository level. You can manage actions or like automations at the repository level. Um, and you typically do some project management also at the repository level as well. Uh, and uh, you also commit into your repository as well. Using a git commit is like using anchors. If you make a mistake, you can't pull past previous commits. So this is what I was saying about um, version the benefits of version control, being able to roll back to the previous version. Um, and also the second part of that quote, and I do love this quote, I think this is a great quote, 
commits are also helpful to others because they show your journey and not just the destination. So remember that showing the evolution of a document couldn't be as important and illuminating as the final finished version as well, because you get to see how it's changed over time. When we're looking at um, version control and the version history of um, a uh, document or a, a file in Git, you can also look at the revisions and versions in real time. So going back through the history of a document, you can uh, evaluate how the document has changed through review, who was inputted into that review, and who has done the final merging as well, which is incredibly valuable if you're trying to figure out just where you went wrong on a particular um, particular set of coding problems or um, a, trying to uh, edit a document as well and you want to follow up with someone. So when you're on Git, you don't save copies of your document, you actually save the life story of the document and its timeline as well. So it's not just the final, final version, a flat finished article, it's also got the rich history behind it as well. And GitHub does all of this. If this all sounds very complicated and uh, like there's a bit too much uh, going on, the good news is the GitHub makes this very straightforward to do, or maybe not very straightforward for somebody who's not worked on it before, but it does make it more straightforward to do. And it captures all of this stuff because GitHub recognizes that version control is an important thing. Um, so you can uh, look at the diagram here. You can see we have Dino, Fox, and Birdie all collaborating on one single document. And uh, in the center here, you can see who has actually done what to the document and which bits they have edited themselves. So which bits they can, uh, they have been taking credit for or have put their time and effort into. So Fox has removed persistence commits, Dino is fixed for widget documentation, and then Birdie's updated the widget instructions and the screenshot and has edited the whole document. So just as a reminder, GitHub, post your collection of files, your repositories online. It can help you work with contributors and collaborators because it's hosted online and is set up to work with a distributed team or a distributed set of collaborators. It provides a web interface for version control. Um, there are features that we probably won't get into today that can be used for project management and communication, but if you want to get into them, I'd love to continue the conversation because I love using their project management tools that have really evolved even since the start of uh, this workshop um, when we get we started giving this workshop. And it's really useful for any project where a group of people are working together, but it's particularly useful when you have a distributed group of people who are often working asynchronously on documents. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to Anne now, but this is the brief pause where we ask you to make sure that you have signed up and logged in to GitHub. And please put an emoji of your choice in the chat if you have logged into GitHub and you are ready to go. This is also a bit of a test to see who's paying. <laughs> Excellent. And do you want me to hand over to you or stop sharing or would you like to? Yeah, that would be great. I will share my screen. So then that way I can maybe jump to a tab if needed, if we're going to demonstrate in real time. We have some uh, champagne bottles, you have some rockets, some penguins, uh, some coffee cups, ladybugs, hands up. Um, great. All right. Looks like we are all logged in. So what I'm going to be doing for the next, let's say, well, let's say 20, 25 minutes or so is walking us through the kind of second part or applied part of our presentation um, around getting started with GitHub in real time. We do have slides that will walk us through those steps, but kind of in parallel, um, you can follow those steps or I'll also be trying to demonstrate it um, in real time too. Okay, so, all right, I'm gonna share these slides now. Perfect, can everyone see my screen okay? Amazing, all right. So let's dive in to using GitHub. All right, 
So again, feel free to follow these steps in real time on your screen. Um, we're going to, through a series of screenshots, kind of walk you through the process of making your own repository um, to kind of demonstrate what kind of creating a repository looks like in real time or repo for sure. Um, friendly collab party is kind of our default name for what we like to demonstrate the process of making a repo. And this repo is really, you know, it's a center for a project. It's the place where all your files are um, online or on your computer. And when you're making a repository, you do have a couple of options here. And let's actually demonstrate this in real time, um, where you have the option to add a description, in real, a description. You can make that repository either public or private. You can add a readme file, which we'll talk more about in a second, um, that has usually more information about the project home, information about contributors and all of that. Um, the Turing Way has a very extensive readme file that we'll show you later on. Um, you can also add a git ignore file. We won't get into the weeds of what this means in real time, but essentially it's kind of chooses, it allows you to keep a list of um, uh, files that you will or will not use um, when you're running, for example, a program, um, as well as a license. Again, we won't have the time to go into today what um, a license does for adding for a project that you have uploaded onto GitHub, but we can definitely share more resources here. Licenses affect how um, people are able to use your resources, whether there's photos or text or code and more, um, whether it's software um, and all sorts of different things. And it's very important, I think, especially in the context of using GitHub, that we think about what licensing does for how we share and collaborate together. Um, let's show you in real time what that looks like. And again, feel free to follow along or stop me at any point. So I'm sitting on the Turing Way repository, which is very, very big. Um, it's the host of the Turing Way. It contains our book. It contains a bunch of project management resources. It's kind of the one-stop shop for many different parts of the Turing Way community. But say I wanted to make my own fresh repository. On the upper right-hand side of the screen, let's see if I can actually zoom in here so it's big for y'all. Um, you do have the option to create a new repository. Let's see, I might already have a friendly, friendly collab party in my, in my um, account already. So I'll say friendly collab party two. Let's see, do I have a friendly collab party? I do, all right. So, cool. You do have the option here to have a use a template. This is sometimes an option, for example, if you're mimicking, um, a, another project a template that may exist, for example, maybe a, a repository for storing notes for a project or a reproducible project template that, for example, at the Alan Turing Institute, we have available for different projects um, that are encouraging reproducibility. We also, in the Turing way, have a reproducible project template, so you could use that as your template. But I'll say here in my um, sample description, um, this repository will be for all things friendly and collaborative. We would like to make this repository public. Um, we would also like to add a readme file and say in terms of license, I'll say let's add a Creative Commons license. All right, so to give you an idea of what you know, a fresh repository looks like in real time, we have this readme file, um, we have um, a license and a readme file, a uh, license, this readme file listed there, um, as well as kind of all of the options we have here. But let's head on over to the next step. Okay, so now that was making your first repository. Uh, maybe if folks want to add an emoji in the chat, if you're able to follow those steps, okay. And we're able to you make your own friendly collab party um, on GitHub yourself as well. Amazing, thanks Kirsty. <laughs> Marianne, incredible. Um, I had a fun additional challenge, which is that it wanted to make it under the Turing Way, um, like owner. 
And I was like, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Don't give me that power. I don't want that power. I made it under Kirsty Jane. <laughs> we will do some forking of the turn wave repo by the end of the hour. <laughs> Amazing. Nice, Neha. Incredible. If anyone gets stuck at any point, uh, if you post a vegetable emoji in the chat, we can follow up with you. Or just post your question or raise your hand and ask. Totally. Stop us at any point. Um, really, our goal for this workshop is to move at the speed that y'all are comfortable with and also to be around for any questions that you may have. Um, we may or may not get through all the slides, but we will um, uh, learn lots of different things about GitHub. Great, Richard. Great, Lauda. For a second, I looked at the ladybug and went, was that a vegetable? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Cool. So we'll move on um, next. Dude, give, give you extra fiber if you need it. Um, all right. So <laughs> I also love this meme whenever I get on the slide. So now that we've created our own repository, um, we'll get a little bit more into the weeds of what types of files sit on our GitHub repositories. Um, what is a readme file and how do you edit it, for example? How do you change the format of the text that you'll see listed there? Um, so Markdown is a syntax. Um, it's a way, um, a syntax for writing that allows the text to be machine readable, which means that it uses certain kind of notations, ways of formatting, et cetera, so that it's able to be read, for example, and, and published online with the kind of regular formatting. The readme file using and uploaded in this kind of readme format is the landing page for your repository. It's where you can add information about your project, you know, the names and ideas of your collaborators, you can invite others, et cetera. But it is very important that it's kind of written in the style of Markdown. And here's an example um, from D3, which is a, a JavaScript library for data visualization, um, where they include more information about how to use uh, their project. Oh, great. Thanks, Ariel. Dropping a link note in the chat. Like I was saying before, some markup uh, language made for writing very quickly formatted text. Funnily enough, Markdown, this Markdown format is written not only by folks, for example, that use code, but it's also written by, used by a lot of script writers as a means of easily formatting text um, in real time. Because it's machine readable, it makes it a lot easier to kind of trade it and use it across different formats and different machines. So it's very widely, widely used. Great for blogs, great for your documentation, and even for writing papers. So this is an example of kind of some of the formatting elements that are required in order to use Markdown. Um, we'll walk through what this looks like, especially within the Turing Way, as all pages within the Turing Way guides are written in the Markdown format. But there are a couple of links here to some cheat sheets with some of that info. So for example, uh, an italic, italicizing text is a, um, an asterisk. The text in it is in another asterisk. Um, images are written uh, in a particular way, etc. Etc. Okay, so before we go on to this exercise, I wanted to show you in real time what the Turing way, what the Turing way um, readme looks like, and what we mean by um, what we mean by markdown. So. The Turing way, of course, is a, has a big old readme file that has lots of different information about the project. Um, for us, it includes information about how to access it in different languages. It also includes information about the project, um, how to cite, for example. Um, you can definitely scroll down here for more information, but all of this formatting and the, and the text used here is all written in the Markdown file in the, the Markdown style, excuse me. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, um, how should I do this That's a better way? So I can access the document by itself. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, that kind of rendered text that we're seeing here translates into 
the same sort of syntax that we saw listed in that table um, earlier. Don't worry too much about, you know, formatting everything perfectly. We've all missed apostroph apostrophes and brackets and asterisks at different points, but it is very important to keep in mind um, when you're working with, for example, um, on different repositories in GitHub, as we folks tend to use this way of formatting text. All right, cool. So next up, what we're going to do together is contribute in real time in Markdown to a um, to a file. So if we want to head here to we have a workshops document on in the in the folder that says GitHub workshops, we do have a file that we will be editing together. Don't worry too much about editing it just yet. Um, we'll get started with that in just a couple of minutes while I'll walk through some kind of last vocabulary around GitHub. Okay, so we've talked a bit about what repositories are. We've talked about the process of using Markdown, but there are a couple of different sets of vocabulary that you'll see Ariel and myself use throughout the rest of this workshop. And we'll talk about commits, branching and forking repositories, pull requests, and merges. Okay, so to get started with commits. As Ariel was saying, using a git commit and I love these climbing metaphors as a climber myself, um, is like using kind of anchors and, and other protection while climbing, because it allows you, if you make a mistake, you can't fall back past your previous commit. Um, and of course they show, um, show your journey, not just kind of the destination or the current version of that project. On GitHub, it doesn't look as glamorous as climbing a wall, or maybe it does, uh, but this is what a commit looks like in real time. Um, these commits, when what you're looking at right now are the notes associated with that um, commit or that change to that file, really allows us to see different versions um, of that file um, as it has been changed and evolved over time. And usually sign marked, for example, with the date in which that happened really, really helpful for seeing how documents evolve over time. So again, like we were saying before, um, when working with GitHub, um, it's very important that, you know, GitHub can help us to, in many ways, um, understand the different steps that are being used um, in real time, um, save different versions in real time so that we're able to kind of untangle the mess of what mass collaboration looks like so that we can focus on, for us, the science-y collaborative work that we want to do. Um, and of course, as we all know, the initial commit, the data cleaned, and the analysis completed can sometimes look a little bit less linear than these three steps. But the important thing about committing changes in real time and showing that progress in real time is that, in fact, um, it does make the process a lot easier to one, follow, and does um, put it out into the open. So code reviewing, and again, we'll talk a little bit about this um, kind of throughout the presentations, but code reviewing and this whole process of looking at re reviews is really just a huge part of the collaborative process. And I particularly love that this comic also emphasizes the importance of project management and of making sure that we are well fed during the process of code reviews. A little bit more about that, what that looks like in real time um, and kind of putting our information um, on GitHub, uh, illustrating in real time what that collaboration looks like. Okay, whoops. Okay. So we went through, walked through what a readme is, started with that. But to kind of go into the next start, like next bit of vocabulary around GitHub, um, the branching and forking is really a branch. If we were to describe, um, if we were to describe, start with the commit as being a way of 
tracking different versions of a document that has been changed over time. A branch, if we were to use, for example, a, ri a river kind of metaphor, um, a branch is what happens when we have taken another version of that document or we've made a change and kind of diverged from the main branch of the river um, in order to make a separate change. So it's like a separate path in the same repository where you can experiment with changes without altering the kind of main path of that main kind of branch of the river. And you can decide whether to keep those changes in that branch or you can discard them um, within your kind of project space. So this illustration right here, essentially showing what that kind of, you have one sort of the main version of that project, um, but you also have a um, another branch that is making a change to that, uh, change that original document. And you can decide whether to merge them into the same um, or to reject that change. Forking, on the other hand, is like making a copy, an entire copy of that project um, to work on it independently. So forking can be really important, especially when you might be, for example, working on a very large project and you're kind of unsure if the changes that you would make would affect a lot of other things. A lot of folks find it a lot um, easier and maybe feel a little bit more low stakes to be able to work on a fork of a project. Um, especially in a community like the Turing Way, where, for example, contributing to a massive repository or a massive project may seem intimidating or like a very big contribution. Um, everyone has kind of a different style and a different way that they, they address it. But um, what's great about forks of projects is that um, that entire copy doesn't require necessarily permission in order to contribute to the repository, like Ariel um, flagged at the beginning of this presentation. Um, and you can keep your kind of copy separate um, and while you work on it and edit it. And you can then bring those changes back later on um, if you would like. Cool. So the kind of next, um, the next kind of exercise that we'll work on, work on here before um, we kind of edit a document together is forking the Turing Way repository in real time. Like I was saying before, it's really for folks can be a nice way of getting started editing different documents um, together kind of in the safe space of their own account. I can show you that in real time. Great, and if there are any questions in the chat, please, please don't hesitate to stop me. All right, cool. So let's, I might actually already have a fork. So we'll see if this, I, I actually do know that I already have a fork. So this may or may not work, but we can also give it a shot. So again, I'm sitting here in the Turing Way kind of home base. And you have the option to fork the repository to create your own copy of the Turing Way in your account. We currently have 647 folks who have forked a version of the Turing Way. Now here, when you create that new fork, it does, it's essentially asks you, you know, uh, who will be the owner of that fork, um, which would be me, of course. And we have the repository name. Maybe just to be safe, I'm going to add a one um, next to the name so that it forks um, completely. Description, don't want to change anything here. And what I'm copying is the kind of main version of the project. Um, using again that metaphor, it's the main version or the main kind of um, river of that, of that project. All right, so yeah, I'm actually not able to, let's see. Maybe if I were to, yeah, if I were to do this, for example, it would fork into the turning way. So unfortunately, I'm actually not able to, <laughs> to fork it completely. <laughs> but maybe if folks want to add into the chat a non-vegetable emoji, if you were able to fork the turning way into your account. Uh, 
<laughs> Amazing. Thanks, Richard. Just in time for, for dinner with a fork and knife emoji. <laughs> totally cursed to you. <laughs> I also have the same challenge as well. I think if you have already, if you're a person on this call and you have already managed to fork the Reaper, you can add a non vegetable emoji in the chat as well. Kirsty. Um, this might be coming later in the workshop, so I'm super sorry if it is. Well, you just tell me if it is. Um, but one of the things that's changed since I was a young person and actually creating tutorials like this is that there is now a button to sync fork. And I don't know if you're going to demo that, Anne, but that would be quite useful for any of us yeah. that um, is is in the same sort of thing. So um Great. So to go to your fork, you can click where it says fork 650. Um, oh, yeah, you can find it this way, too. Yeah. Oh, let me grab my... That was it. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, did, did, I... Oh, oh, oh. did I miss it? Yeah, there we go. Oh, That's you. Great. Yep. Thank you. And then there's a little button underneath the green code button. It says sync fork. And so maybe you could demo that. I haven't actually clicked that yet. Yeah. <laughs> maybe you could demo what's what's going to happen. And you can see that it, folks can see that it's 4,752 commits behind the main. Oh, thank you, Kirsty. Yes, super, super important. Um, definitely material we can add to this workshop now that this sync fork exists. Um, yes, you can see that my, my fork <laughs> of the Turing way is frozen in time. Um, and it's almost 5,000 commits behind the um, current version. So I'm gonna click here, hopefully nothing breaks. And this is syncing my version. So my parallel version of the Turing way to the main one. And it's now up to date. Great. All right. So, oh my gosh, Gersty is, is 12,000. Not anymore. Slides. Not anymore. Now it's totally up to speed. Everything's cool. Amazing. <laughs> Great. All right. So, we are on to the next little last bits of vocab um now that we know all there is to know about branches and forks and just in time again for dinner if you're based in uk or around uk time zones um all right so on to the pull request so a pull request um, in this kind of, so we've talked about how. Oh, um, and were we gonna have a, a brief break here? We've actually oh. hit 45 minutes bang on the dot and we were gonna take a break. Yeah. we dived into PRs. Oh my gosh, of course. Thanks for catching me, Ariel. Um, yes, great. let's take a five minute break here, folks. Um, if you wanna grab a little snack, um, which I am definitely going to do after seeing all the emojis in the chat, um, we'll be back at the 50. And we will pass on to Ariel, and um, who will talk us a bit through pull requests um, and how to make changes, merge them in real time. Um, we'll do a little edit together, and then we'll move forward. See you all in five minutes.
just unpause the recording there. Okay. Uh, Kirsty, yeah, if you have a bit of an advanced question, and I can also see that some of the folks on the call have mentioned uh, GitHub Actions as well. Um, we're hoping to have some time at the end that's a bit more freeform uh, where we can get into uh, that. I can see emojis appearing in the chat. People are back. Good stuff, good stuff. Um, and as always, feel free to add questions into the notepad as well, the shared notes document. You're very welcome to share your thoughts there. Hopefully nobody can hear the leaf blower that has just started up like clockwork. They do this every, <laughs> outside my window, they do this every single week, whether there's leaves or not. Um, so hopefully that's just annoying me and not everyone else. Cool. Okay. Well, let me get my screen up. And it's going to take a little time to load, but hopefully you can all see pull request PR. What is one of those? Can everyone see that? Thumbs up from somebody? Yes. Okay. Awesome. I hope you're all back so that we're and ready to dive into the wonderful world of pull requests. Um, this is perhaps some of the terminology that I had the most trouble with when I uh, first started with GitHub. Um, but essentially, you've managed to fork the repository or you've created a branch of uh, the main repository. You've made some changes. You have some thoughts and ideas. And now you want to include those back into the main branch. And I will note that there's some old terminology here. Uh, GitHub used to call the primary repository a master repository, and that's now changed to main repository. So that's a bit of old terminology in there that's uh, recently been updated. But basically, when you create a pull request, what you are asking is to have the changes that you're proposing pulled into the main repository. And that's where the terminology pull request comes from. It's not that you are, and it's because you're not uh, forcing um, the changes. People have to review and approve it and pull it in. So it's an action from the main repository to you to approve the changes and get them merged. At least that's what makes sense in my brain <laughs> is that it's an enthusiastic action to pull stuff in. Um, so you can see a little diagram here of the uh, of this in action. So you can see there's a, a branch that's here. We have a deviation. We've made some commits. We have a, a deviation from what's currently in the main document, in the main repository. We're making a pull request to say, I've made some changes. Please, can these be pulled into the main repository? Then you see the process of going through some code reviews and discussions. Maybe somebody needs some changes made. Maybe it turns out that there's a bug that uh, is causing some issues that needs working out. Maybe there's some conflicts with some existing uh, other um, uh, documentation that needs working out. And then eventually this is resolved, hopefully, and the uh, pull request is merged and pull, the changes are pulled into the main repository. So I hope that makes sense to folks. Um, and so this is sort of an overview of how this happens in most open source projects. If you don't own the repository, if you are not the person who is uh, uh, GitHub considers to be the owner of a repository, so the person who set it up or been assigned the privilege of being the owner with all of the power that entails, uh, this is most likely the process that you'll follow. So you see a repo, you want to contribute to it. Think great. You can fork that repository. You can make the changes that you want to make in that repository. And then you make a pull request for the changes you've made back to the original repository. Then the author, the owner, or in the Turing Ways case, other contributors will review and comment and make a call on whether or not your um, changes will be merged into the main repository. And then finally, clear step, make big friends and have big party, which is what the Turing Way is all about. So um, the other thing I just wanted to uh, clarify, we had one uh, a comment, is that 
then it's a bit maybe unclear about the difference between forking a repository and working on a branch of a repository. And so to be clear, forking the repo a repository means that you copy in its entirety a repository over to sort of your own space in GitHub. Whereas if you are working on a branch of a main repository, you're just working on a little a little side shoot of the, the current repository that you're working on. So you can, uh, so it, I took a bit of time to like get comfortable with the two things, but basically forking is you copying the entire repository and you can do that for a variety of different reasons. Um, one of which might be, I want to totally revise and remix this entire project to do my own thing and suit my own needs. And I'm not gonna contribute that back. Whereas a branch is where you're making specific edits that you would definitely like to um, merge back to the main repository. And that normally requires also a bit of permissions and things like that and being added as a collaborator. So I hope that's clear. Um, and that everyone's uh, with me on that. Uh, now, this is the bit that everybody, or at least I got intimidated about when I started, was making my first pull request. We're going to do this in a very nice, low stakes way. Uh, Anne, could you share, reshare the link in the chat that uh, you uh, previously had? Uh, so we're going to head to a particular document in uh, the Turing Way repository, which is found in our workshops, GitHub workshops uh, folder entitled 2024 November.md. Thank you very much, Anne, for sharing the link. Uh, so if you weren't able to navigate there, uh, please don't put it in the May intro. You can, it's not the end of the world, but uh, it will just be a bit confusing. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to add your details uh, to the file. You do this by, hold on, I kind of, let me just, uh, oh, stop sharing my screen. That's the markdown cheat sheet. This is the one, nope. We'll get there in the end. I just reforked the repository. It, Ariel, we do have a question yeah. in the chat. Should we be making that change in our fork or in the main repository? So the best practice is to make it in your fork, right? Um, so if you go, hold on. If I go into here and I navigate to workshops, go to GitHub workshop, I find 2024 November GitHub intro session. And then I click on edit this file over in the corner. I love the fact that it's still got a pen. It's really great. And then uh, here, I might add my name. Uh, and then because it's this is my fork, I can commit my changes just fine. Uh, you commit the message, update November MD with my name. And then an extended de description, I've added my name. How exciting. But you can also, this is uh, for sections where you might want to um, provide more detail on the nature of the pull request and things like that. So like, if it's maybe uh, a whole chunk of code you're trying to commit, talking about how you would, uh, what the code is intended to do, why you've made the edits, et cetera, et cetera. It's just an extra extended um, description. Commit the changes. And then I believe if we go back to the Turing way, you can then go here. And pull up a new pull request. Uh, 
and is this not right? So you I'm have um let's see. So uh, if you were to go, oh sorry. Yeah. Uh, Laura, if you have navigated away from your uh, fork, you head here to the home, and you should be able to find your fork in the top repositories down here. So mine is here. So if you were to go back, for example, to your fork, what you're able to do in order to contribute that change upstream, um, upstream to the turn way is right there on the main page. There is next to the sink there fork, there's the contribute. And there you go. Does that make sense, everyone? That has changed since the last time I committed from a fork. So I'm learning something <laughs> new today, everyone, as well. Kirsty, you have your hands up. <laughs> yeah, I was one of the things that um <clears throat> I think is really helpful to explain, and you're doing a great job, both of you, is um the GitHub user interface changes, and that's like that's just something to kind of recognize. One of the other things that I think is very confusing about GitHub is that there are many ways to do the same thing. And that actually, that's that's super confusing. I was gonna show people how they can find um, their fork from the Turing way slash the Turing way. Would you be up for clicking through and demonstrating that? Because I, I think it's a little bit more intuitive than looking at a great big long list. Oh yeah, sure. Hold on. So if you go, go if you go to the Turing way slash the Turing way in GitHub, yeah. Um, if you go over to where it says fork at the top there, and there's 651 forks, we've got a new fork um, over the course of this of this workshop. If you click on the little down, you can see the forks that you own, and then that allows you to take it there. So both or there's multiple ways of doing it. Ariel's way is definitely works if you don't have lots of repositories. And this way is a little bit more direct if you're a bit nervous that, like me, you have many, many sort of decaying links <laughs> in your homepage. The Turing Way version 670D. Um, exactly. So you can see the existing forks there as well. Thank you. Um, and yeah, uh, so just to go back to opening my pull request, you can see at the top, it's talking about um, the base repository. So the base repository is the one that we want to pull our changes into. Uh, and then the branch that we want to pull our um, changes into in that repository is the main one. So you might, if you are making, if you and a, uh, a bunch of colleagues are working on a project, like working on changes in a branch and you're making lots and lots of edits, you might have a case where you wanted to merge changes into a branch first before they were merged into the main branch of the Turing way, for example. Um, and there are sometimes also restrictions on who can actually merge into um, main branches and things like that. You, if you've heard the phrase push to production, uh, that sort of when stuff like goes into the main uh, repository and goes live uh, and then shenanigans ensue sometimes hopefully not but um, and then you can also see here we have the head repository which is the repository that we're pulling in from you can actually see as well if you click on the uh, the button down below you can see these are all the people who have uh, forked the Turing way as well so and then um, Equally, if you've got if you were developing on a particular branch of your uh, fork, then you can swap over to that branch. And so, what you might do, for example, is keep your main Turing Way repo that you forked up to date with the main um, repo of the the project, the Turing Way project, and then you develop on different branches. Check that it can be merged, and then on your own part of the project and then do a pull request into the main part. So it's all about having the opportunity to check that things are working and different ways of doing different things as well. And believe me when I say that this gets simpler, the more you do it, it feels very complicated and clunky at first if you're not used to doing it, uh, used to working in this way, but it is much, much simpler with practice. Speaking as somebody who, yeah, again, not a technical person. <laughs> Um, 
great. So I've opened a pull request. I need to add a title uh, that explains what the pull request is and gives a summary of the changes that I would like to be made. So we might have, uh, I mean, this one is very descriptive, update this document with my name. Um, this is also automatically added. We have templates in the Turing Way repo. So a lot of this text is automatically added by the project, but it's not there. If you go and open a pull request on your uh, your first repo, um, then this template, this text will not be there, but you're welcome to nick it from the Turing Way if you'd like. Um, we have a summary up here from my extended description. I've added my name, how exciting. And then there is a, um, uh, a few different areas to, um, and details to as and when you, as relevant, basically. So in the summary, you should describe the problem you're trying to fix in this pull request, reference any related issues. Um, so if you're trying to fix, uh, and we'll go into issues later on, um, you also need to add a list of changes that you're proposing in the pull request. So you can either use bullet points or by fill checklist. Um, adding my name to the well, because I attended this meeting. Um, and then if you have particular things you would like a reviewer to check, so when you're asking people to review uh, your changes, what should a reviewer concentrate uh, their feedback on? I'm gonna delete uh, everything else and just say, does everything look okay? Hopefully I've not got any merge conflicts going on. Um, and then finally, acknowledging contributors uh, all contributors to this pull request are already named in the table of contributors in the readme file. I am already named in the table of contributors in the readme file, so I'm actually going to put an X there. And then you can create a pull request. But say you want to make sure that you've got like a copy of the changes saved, but they're not quite ready for review. You click the down button next to it you can create a draft pull request where you're basically saying, I think I'm gonna merge this stuff, but I haven't quite finished the final paragraph or I need to work out on some bug fixes. You can create a draft pull request um, that you can then go back to and uh, note as ready for review. This one is definitely ready for review. So I'm going to create the pull request and just hit the nice green button there. Mm -hmm. Ariel, while I review your pull requests, we have a couple of pull requests made already of folks' names um, that I did do a review of. So if you want to double check those, we could merge some of those pull requests in real time. Amazing. OK. Right. Who was first? It was Marianne. Well done, Marianne. I've written my first MD code. Yes, you have indeed. Um, you'll also see we have a nice, we have a whole bunch of automation uh, on the get on uh, the Turing way. You get a nice welcome and congratulations on your first pull request. Uh, we also double check that the uh, preview looks okay as well. I'm sure it will look fine for this one, but essentially we have a, a series of checks that come in automatically when people want to make changes to make sure that uh, the changes that they're planning to make aren't going to fully break uh, the project. So it's it makes it hard, it's called continuous integration and it makes it a lot harder um, or just slows down the possibility of somebody actually merging a change that's gonna cause us real issues. Um, so if we go through, I believe, it's not, uh, sorry, it won't appear in here, will it? it? Won't appear in the preview because it's not part of the book, sorry. But if you are adding stuff to the book, then you will be able to check out the preview of what you've tried to change and then be able to check that it's all rendered okay and it looks fine and things like that. Um, Anne has already approved these changes, which is great. Um, I'm just gonna double check and approve the changes as well. Marianne's on... Uh, on line seven, and I'm hoping that's not going to cause any issues. I'll submit my review. And then 
Oh yes. And your very first pull request as well, we um, do pause some of the checks just to make sure. Um, but I believe we can squash and merge this one. Do you want to explain what squash means? Yes. So if there are lots and lots of commits on a very long pull request that has been developed, there might be a case where you decide that really you just want to be able to preserve the final commit for that file. And so squashing <laughs> the coding version of Twist and Shout, squashing and merging, um, <laughs> the, you just put in a single commit, which is the, the final version of the file. Um, if you wanted to preserve all of the commit history, you can create a merge commit. And But this is much of a muchness for this one because we have a single commit in this. But it's basically, do you want all of the commits from this branch to be added? Or are you happy to just have the final commit in there? We're happy to squash and merge it. I suspect that we will not have any issues with the accessibility alt text bot or the file sizes. So I will squash and merge this one. Nice work. Marianne, confirm, squash and merge. Great. And now you can see uh, up here, we've got a nice big purple merge uh, symbol. Um, and you can see I've approved those changes and I've like the history of that is now I've merged this particular commit reference into the Turing way name now. You can also see that if I want to undo those changes, I'm not going to Marian, by the way, but there is an option here to create a new pull request to basically revert back to a previous version of that uh, file as well. And then you get a nice congratulations. To say well done on merging your first pull request. Pull request. Does anyone have any questions on that? I realize that uh, that process can be can feel a little technical. So does, this is a good moment to pause and just check if anyone is uh, struggling with this. Or if anyone's got any questions about other stuff. Kirsty. So you can choose to use these last 15 minutes however you want. If you try to merge both Richard's and my pull requests, then one of us will create a merge conflict. So this is going into kind of, this is definitely um, not kind of, easy like like the first few things that you learn about github so i'm saying this obviously to everyone else um however <laughs> it's very easy to to sort of get into a world where you have a merge conflict and so uh it's up to you i don't know how you want to use 15 minutes but you have a merge conflict uh looming in the in the near future oh. uh should you wish to demonstrate what happens because i'm happy to be the pawn on the other side if you'd like yeah that's totally fine. Okay, let me just double check. So, oh, we already have one actually, because Nihas was at line three as well. So, if I remember, we also have Seb Sebastian's as well on the same line as Marianne. So, that looks fine in terms of files changed from here, right? We can't see any any errors or anything, any issues. However. When we go back into the conversation tab where all of the um, history of the discussion on this pull request is kept, we go down here. We have changes approved, which is great. All the checks have passed, wonderful. This branch has conflicts that must be resolved. Uh, and if we click on this button to resolve the conflicts, we can see that, uh, what they've suggested is we put Richard on line four and Neha on line six. 
that's not that's not quite right no. that's no, can I Kirsty do you yeah. want to take this over <laughs> yeah I can I can I can sorry so so this is why it's not super advanced it's not super uh, beginner but it, it also happens very easily and once you're in it it's very it's very overwhelming so what this is telling you is that the pull request with this is which comes from a branch called git hyphen workshop hyphen 2024 hyphen 10 hyphen 98 so richard is demonstrating very very clear naming of branches very good um so so richard's incoming branch has uh richard's name on the um coming in uh, as a as a bullet point and then what the um then, then on line five, you've got a separator that's then showing what's in the main um, branch of the repository. So in the Turing way as the fork slash as the main repository slash main branch, Niha's name is in there. And that's indicated by those right arrows on um, line eight. And so one of the things that you can do is you could you could reject the pull request. You could say to Richard, um, please, can you move your name to another line? Please, could you update your fork so that you can see Niha's name and then you'll be able to fix it? Or, so these are all sort of simpler ones. I know it's not very simple when you're doing it fast in a workshop. Or Ariel, as the person who's going to merge this um, pull request, Ariel can actually use her own expertise to propose to Git what the best way forward is going to be. So I would like to suggest that Ariel deletes line three to just get rid of all the text on there. You can get rid of the blank space as well. Deletes line five, yep. And get rid of the blank space on what's now line four as well and delete that one, yep. And so what Ariel is doing is Ariel saying, Niha didn't do anything wrong. Richard didn't do anything wrong. It's just we asked you to do two tasks in parallel and that caused a merge conflict. So I actually think you should add in the space underneath the heading, by the way. I feel like you get into strange things if you do something underneath the heading. Um, so Ariel, as the maintainer of the GitHub repository, has said, I'm not going to make either of you do anything more because I can see the best way forward here. And now we've got three names in the list. And you can mark that as resolved. And it's going to, what you're now going to do is you're going to commit a merge. This page is out of date. Start over. Oh, no. <laughs> so let's try again. We will. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so, so we should be able to do this, right? Try it. Yeah, try markers resolved. There's an interesting possibility that might be coming up that you're trying to write to Richard's um, fork, which could be a problem. But no, no it's okay. Works. You've done that it. Works. You've done it. It was just that we wasted Great. a little too long for the merge to happen. There we go. Yeah. Uh, great. I'm going to uh, squash and merge this because there's also uh, the other thing about this is that it also my battery's running low. I know. I didn't like it. Um, <laughs> is uh, that? Um, oh no, I don't want to merge via the command line. That's fine. Um, is that uh, by squashing commits down, you also keep the size of the repository. Um, or moving for a uh, sensible size as well. Um, so we'll confirm the squash and mine. Thanks for bearing with. And then we go merge. Okay. Um, we will get everybody's uh, pull requests merged in a bit, but I am just conscious that we have about uh, 10 minutes left. I very, very quickly just want to go through um how the Turing weight operates for those of you that are coming along to the book dash um just so that you've got an idea of how things work and then uh hopefully we'll have some time for questions or discussions or get into some of the other uh stuff that people have mentioned about so for the Turing way uh we use 
the um, uh, GitHub repo as a source of all of our, well, many, many of our ideas uh, for different things to improve the project uh, and support the guides. Um, we start sharing our ideas by hitting new issue. And you will see there is a whole different set of templates to look at, depending on what your idea pertains to. Um, so you might want to do a new chapter. You might be giving a Turing Way talk. You might need to report something that is currently broken. Or if you'd like to edit a chapter, for example, you can um, click one of those. If you click on those, get started. You'll see it comes in and we had some contributors who did some very fancy work on this, by the way, this is all done using a YAML template. And if we want to get it, I feel like that is advanced GitHub project management stuff that we will definitely get into another time. But it basically, <laughs> it does look amazing. And they did a lot of work on it. And I'm like very impressed. Uh, it was, I believe, mostly Old and Connor who uh, actually put these together initially um, and updated them. So it'll ask you to add a title, uh, decide which guide you would like to your chapter to be a part of. If you've got a link to a draft, so if you've been writing it up somewhere that's not GitHub, either HackMD or a file on your GitHub branch, it'll ask you to do a summary of proposed chapter, any external resources, who might also be able to help on this. And then um, also ask you to identify how far along you are in terms of um, your uh, progress towards a new chapter. And so people click on these issues, they fill them in, they add some uh, labels to help identify them as well. Uh, so for example, our current book dash uh, label is here, zero book dash November 24th. Um, and let me just see, but can we find issue i believe there's one on this page da, da, da. is it the next one it's the next one maybe while ariel's finding the issue something that i'll flag here is that in our slides where we talked primarily about pull requests the difference between issues and pull requests can sometimes be confusing for folks that are just getting started with github I tend to yes, think of an right. issue as something like a shopping list and an, a pull request being like the, the items that you're buying yourself and the grocery bag being the kind of project container at the repository. So an issue isn't making any changes, but it's kind of noting those. It's making a list of things that you would like to add, keeping track of a project, et cetera. But then the pull request are those actual tangible material changes that you're making. Um, which could be addressing something in your list. So just to delve into this one super quickly, this is an edit on a particular chapter that uh, is being proposed here by Cass. Thank you very much, Cass, for proposing it. Uh, she's given us a summary, what needs to be done, who might be able to help, and then updates on how it's progressing. And you'll see over in this corner here, she has linked a work in progress pull request and if we click on that link, we can see da, 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 this is the pull request of the actual changes that she is making um, there. So, and if we go into the files here, so slow. you can see that uh, they're currently working through um, editing. Uh, this file. So all of the stuff that's being deleted is in red and all of the stuff that's being added is in green to make review easier. This is listed as a work in progress, which means it's not quite ready for merging yet and is not considered a, a final version. Um, and you can see even at the top, we've got 40 comments, 24 commits, three files changed. This is an ongoing thing that's in development there. So um, that's how it works in the Turing way, is that we expect people to open an issue first to uh, identify the change that they would like to make and then link that to a pull request that's making the changes that they're proposing. Um, I'm gonna pause there 
and pause my screen sharing as well so that I can come back and, and see you all a little bit easier. Um, and we just have a short amount of time uh, for questions, comments. All of this stuff, it, um, there's a lot of material that we've gone through today. You have your own repository now. The best advice I can give you is to play around in your own repository, play around in your fork of the Turing way and investigate things and change things and figure out what works and what doesn't. Practice doing things like merging pull requests um, and just see how things work because uh, we can go through it in sort of a, a formal way, but honestly, getting really mired in the middle is how uh, I think a lot of people <laughs> figure it out so yeah open to any questions i will just go and double check in the um ah so kirsty had a question which was do we like people to fork the repository and create branches there or do we prefer to have folks create branches within the repository um and uh, folks have answered, I've been working from fork. This keeps the number of branches in the main repository down. Um, oh, Laura. OK, good question. I'm very new to GitHub. One slightly confusing thing I found is, are these files viewable outside of GitHub as a document or such only if they're published to the website? So the, it <laughs> the, the unhelpful answer is it depends. Uh, so you might have seen when we first uh, set up a repository, you can set it to public or private. If you set it to private, that means that only you and the people you add are able to see that repository. If you set it to public, your uh, files are viewable by anyone who comes across the repository. Um, and then if you are looking at if what you if your question was actually about can I view these as a document, the answer is yes, but they just render slightly differently. And I'm just gonna get up an example of that and then share my screen again. Super quickly. So if we hit a random file on this communication chat, hold on, it's loading. Okay, good. Uh, we pick a random file here. We've got Slack welcome guide.md and you click on it. You can see it renders, so it displays as markdown text and you can change the view from preview to code here and here you can see this is the markdown version of the document but by default it will open as preview and then show pretty nice and the same goes for the uh, readme files as well ariel maybe something that can add to this too is that if you shared in your screen sharing on the turing way book website if folks find it easier to be reading through the books in that way and then flagging an issue or suggesting an edit to that page, maybe we can show them how we can kind of take people from that rendered version of the book to being able to add an issue on GitHub. Heck yeah. Okay, cool. We'll do that very quickly. So we head over to the turnway.org, read our guides. And there's a lot of material on here. We'll go to the guide for project design. And you might have a very strong feeling about the guide for project design. I certainly do. Uh, and you can come up here to the little GitHub Octocat. And this the Octocat is the uh, GitHub uh, mascot. And you can open an issue. And then it will take you to directly open an issue on the Turing way. You won't have any of the fancy um, any of the fancy templates or anything like that, but you can, if, should you so desire, you see uh, a typo 
or a bug or something that's so wrong uh, that it simply must be edited. You can see it will pull in at the top issue on page, project design, project design, so that you can remember what the page was that you were looking to suggest changes to as well. I believe you can also suggest an edit. Um, but I would not recommend doing this because then you start editing the main. Um, but, but if you were like, I need to fix the typo, this is very important. You could then come in, make, in, make the brief edit and then set up a pull request from there making direct edits. But we'd recommend that you don't use that route at least while you're getting started. Uh, we've got comments in the chat. Let me stop sharing my screen again. We're at time. Um, but yeah, definitely open for questions now. Uh, does anyone have any, I can see there's a few discussions in the shared notes document. If you want to keep it in the shared notes document, that's totally fine. Kirsty. I I just uh, feel compelled to say that um, one of the purposes of working on GitHub is to, uh, for the Turing way, is to provide an extremely, extremely safe space, like as safe as we possibly could ever be, to figure out these um, workflows. And it's because... Um, although we're very proud of the book that is the Turing Way and the guides that are inside of that and available on the on websites as, as a as a link, um, actually the biggest change that will be made in the world is more people being able to contribute to open source projects very broadly. So um, the opportunity to ask questions um, can either come in the Turing Way Slack workspace you can ask questions there um, or you can come along to a collaboration cafe or if you're coming along to a book dash um, I just want to really really emphasize that the whole not literally the whole point of the project but maybe like 95 percent of the point of the project is to provide this space to allow people to kind of understand how they can contribute through um, a sort of stereotypical or traditional open source workflow. So definitely um, bring bring all of, all of your questions and we strongly encourage you to get into Git Tangles because we will be the friendly people that will get you out of them. And it's normally, as this call has aptly demonstrated, a collective effort to solve things because we have people with different levels of familiarity and technology and skills and all of that kind of stuff. And that's what makes the Turing Way such an awesome project. Um, just really quickly in uh, final closing, um, uh, I had one person who's asked about um, attending the Book Dash. If you didn't apply for the Book Dash, I'm afraid you're too late for the November one, but we will be running another one. We do these twice a year. We will be running another one in May, 2025. And there will also be share out sessions on the Friday, the 8th of November. And I think Anne is just looking up the uh, sign up form for those. So if you're interested and you didn't manage to uh, sign up in time this time around, you are more than welcome to join us for the share outs where we celebrate all the work that's going on um, and people have done over the week. And there will be another opportunity next year to sign up for the May one. Um, and we'll host another one in November 2025 as well. Um, also, if you're not on the Turing Way Slack, I hope you will find your way there as well. Oh, and thank you, Anne, for uh, flagging our next Collaboration Cafe on the 20th of November. So if you get if you want to get stuck in and you've got ideas and you want to come and talk about them with other community members, that's the place to go. And um, yeah, if you have any more questions, we have um, a GitHub channel on uh, the Turing Way Slack, you can come and ask all the questions uh, that you want to. Because everybody had to get started with GitHub once. Um, and we have a lot of very friendly people who are more than willing to help you out.
thanks very much everyone that's a that's a wrap